In this week's episode of Bleach the Thousand Year Blood War, Mayuri duels the zombified Hitsugaya, Byakuya goes head to head with the stern Ritter of love, and Yuhabak finally arrives at the royal palace. Well, here we are. We've arrived at the epic conclusion to the second Quincy invasion. Alright, that's a little facetious of me. Technically, the epic conclusion to the second Quincy invasion is coming up. Of course, it's the showdown in the royal palace, which I want to dedicate a video to before next week's episode releases. But this is the final set of battles in the Seireite itself. The battle in the Seireite began in episode 14, so it's taken just under 10 episodes to get to this point, which really isn't a lot of time. That being said, for the most part, I think the invasion, the war, was handled fairly well here in the anime. Perhaps most of all, I appreciated the tying up or total erasure of the loose ends left in the source material. Things like Renji and Nanana's totally dropped subplot, for example. The second Quincy invasion is both faster but also neater here in the anime. Last week I mentioned the character art had improved and hoped that it would maintain this level of quality, and I'm happy to confirm that at least for now, it is doing so. Episode 23 of the Thousand Year Blood War is another fantastic looking entry into the anime, featuring some surprisingly great animation for areas of the story that I thought might get a little overlooked. But I don't think anyone is complaining about seeing Pepe get smacked around in extremely fluid and high quality. A little like last week, this episode could have easily felt like a mere stepping stone on the path to the massive battle in the Royal Palace, but I think the team did a good job at not letting this episode succumb to that feeling. It's another really solid entry, and you guys know me, you know that I was looking forward to the possibilities this week, and in many ways the episode totally delivered. And so, as we begin our in-depth spoiler review and discussion of the Thousand Year Blood War arc episode 23, Marching Out the Zombies 2, as always, I'll be looking at this episode from the perspective of someone who has read all of the Thousand Year Blood War arc, meaning there will be potential spoilers for the entire arc to follow as we take a look at this episode to see what it added, what it changed, and what it took away from the source material. Before we get started on the video though, guys, if you haven't done already, make sure to hit subscribe for more Bleach content like this every single week. And if you enjoyed the video when you're done with it, make sure to give it a thumbs up as well to help support me and the channel. And if you want to take that support from me another step further, I do also have a Patreon as well. And as always, I want to give an enormous shout out and say a massive thank you to every single person supporting me there over on Patreon. I really do appreciate each and every one of you. Thank you all so very much. So once again this week, likely thanks to episodes 20 and 21 being so jam packed. We're not covering many chapters this time. In fact, the episode plays out exactly as I predicted it would, which is great as it means hopefully good things for the conclusion of this core. Don't get me wrong, we're still covering a lot of stuff, but as I anticipated, the anime blasts through the first portion of this episode in really about five minutes or so. In fact, the episode felt quick overall. There's very little cut this week, and there's a chunk of new content to contend with as well, so we're feeling pretty condensed here. So, these were the chapters that were covered in episode 23. Firstly, we have chapter 592, Marching Out the Zombies 3. Chapter 593, Marching Out the Zombies 4. Chapter 594, Rub Dolls. Chapter 595, Rub Dolls 2 and chapter 596, Rub Dolls 3. You can see Kubo was being very creative with his chapter titles around this time. After this, though, we get the first couple of pages as well from chapter 597, Winded by the Shadow, before including cut content from last week. The cliffhanger of chapter 587, The Headless Star 6, and the first few pages of chapter 588, The Headless Star 7. The episode's title, Marching Out the Zombies 2, doesn't technically feature in the chapters this week. I get why they called it that, but I wonder if Rub Dolls wouldn't have made more sense. Also, chapter 597 could be winded by the shadow, which in some ways would make more sense, but since Nyanzal's shrift is the wind and not the wind, 
I do have to wonder if it isn't winded by the shadow, but that really doesn't sound right to me. Again, aside from the smattering of additional pages at the end here, it's another episode covering a mere five chapters, which is great. It's that number that enabled us to get the small fight for Byakia this week, which was an absolute highlight. There are some oddities. Last week I praised the episode for finally splitting a fight across multiple weeks, but it is kind of funny and even a little anticlimactic when that cliffhanger, here being the arrival of zombie Hitsugaya, is then resolved in literally five minutes in the following episode because there's so much to cover. I do think the anime team is in a tough spot when it comes to this sort of thing. I mean, what are they really supposed to do in these circumstances? Personally, I still think it's better to have been able to split the fight than not at all. Anyway, there's lots of episodes to talk about this week, so let's get into the spoiler analysis. The episode opens with a recap of last week's cliffhanger as the zombified Hitsugaya arrives on the battlefield. Normally, it can be a little annoying when they reuse scenes at the start of an episode, but this one makes total sense. It's the first scene featured in chapter 592, as everyone involved in the fight looks on in shock and horror at Giselle's unexpected reinforcements. The immediate action sequence plays out very faithfully to the source material and is adapted well. As Hitsugaya lifts his blade, Yumichika prepares to use a Bakudo in an attempt to stop him. However, realising that isn't going to work, Ikaku smacks Yumichika with Hozaki Maru, sending the fifth seat flying into the air as Hitsugaya unleashes a massive torrent of ice. However, Ikaku himself was caught in the icy blast, his entire leg frozen solid. Wincing in pain, Ikaku commends Hitsugaya, but the undead captain doesn't relent. Instead, he's immediately upon him, stabbing Ikaku through the back before ripping his sword out and slashing him once more. The anime does a great job with this sequence, and I'm glad they didn't skimp out on any of the brutality. How cold and ruthlessly efficient this version of Hitsugaya defeats his enemies is a key part of him being a zombie. As Hitsugaya goes in for another strike, Yumichika blocks his blade, the two of them locking swords over Ikaku's unconscious body. Yumichika desperately tries to activate his true Shikai Ruriro Kujaku, but Hitsugaya is much too quick for him. Side note, could Yumichika have defeated the zombified Hitsugaya if he'd managed to successfully activate and use Ruriro Kujaku? On the surface, I'd be inclined to say yes, because his Zanpakuto is extremely powerful and has been shown to work on officers of much higher rank than Yumichika before, such as when he used it to defeat Hisagi. However, as we see in the battle between Rukia and Rudborn, ice is extraordinarily effective at destroying these more bio-organic plant-like Zanpakuto, such as Rudborn's Arbol and, of course, Yumichika's Ruriro Kujaku. So I wonder if Hitsugaya just froze the vines immediately, they would be rendered totally ineffective. However, that never happens anyway because Hitsugaya jams his knee into Yumichika's gut. The anime doesn't highlight the fact that Hitsugaya covered his knee in jagged ice quite as much, but it is still there and visible as blood spurts out of Yumichika's stomach. Hitsugaya then grabs Yumichika by the hair, viciously headbutts him before bringing down his sword in a violent arc, ripping Yumichika's torso open and knocking him out in a spray of blood. With both Ikaku and Yumichika down, taken out in the space of about a minute's worth of episode time, I think this scene works well in the anime thanks to the lack of changes from the source material. Kubo showed us how brutal Hitsugaya can be and how quickly and effortlessly an unshackled Hitsugaya can be rid of lower level opponents and it works extremely well here too. Seeing this Hitsugaya in motion is effective, as is watching him completely dismantle Yumichika once the fifth seat unwisely yet emotionally steps onto the battlefield with him. However, Mayuri steps in, intrigued by Hitsugaya's current predicament. I feel like it's actually quite impressive how fast Mayuri moves when he's instantly behind Hitsugaya after the latter tries to swing at him. As Giselle confirms Mayuri's theory that Hitsugaya was turned into a zombie before he died, so she likely just splashed him with blood upon finding him unconscious, she explains the advantages of using the zombie on Shinigami who are still alive, revealing that their minds disappear entirely, making them more submissible. However, Mayuri simply grins, wondering what's so fun about controlling people that don't have a mind of their own. Suddenly, Charlotte reappears, having easily defeated Zombie Bambietta last week. As Charlotte prepares to attack Hitsugaya, Mayuri roars for him to back off, but it's too late. 
Hitsugaya drives his sword down Charlotte's body, a jet of blood bursting out of the Iran car, Charlotte's eyes wide in horror as he keels backwards, one of his hands severed in an instant. This scene again looks fantastic, the desperation on Mayuri's face, the way everything moves so fluidly. Interestingly though, despite the slash from Hitsugaya's sword clearly swiping downwards, in the next shot, we see that he actually brought his sword upwards instead, akin to the original chapter. As Hitsugaya goes in for a second strike, a massive gold barrier appears in front of him, blocking his attack, causing his blade to rebound. As I mentioned in my live reaction, not only does the barrier look really cool, but it's absolutely massive as well, and it seems like Mayuri summoned it as easily as clicking his fingers. I wonder if this is a Kido or some kind of special defensive invention of Myri's that he was able to use instantaneously. Leaving Charlotte bleeding out on the ground, Myri prepares to battle Hitsugaya himself, finally stepping into the ring. The barrier dissipates in a flurry of sparks as we reach the end of chapter 592 already. Not quite as beefy as the first chapter covered in last week's episode, that's for sure, and Myri mockingly asks for Hitsugaya's permission to test several new drugs on him, all, of course, for the sake of the Seireite. The implication here, of course, is that although Hitsugaya supposedly can't reply, as far as Mayuri knows, he can't consent, as a Shinigami, he should be happy to take part regardless if it's for Seireite's sake. It takes us back to one of the themes of this battle that we looked at in some depth last week, the question of what does the life of a soldier of the Gotei 13 actually mean. However, this is going to be a pretty speedy review if the anime continues to stick so closely to the source material this week. As we move into chapter 593, we see a shot that will begin to look pretty familiar as the fight plays out. We get a mostly chapter accurate title drop as the screen fizzes with static, causing Myri's face to distort and flicker as the name appears. And once the opening credits are out of the way, the battle begins. Hitsugaya swings at Mayuri, but the captain avoids the strike and fires a mess of webbing from within his sleeves at the ground, attempting to ensnare Hitsugaya. We get a brief new shot in the anime of Hitsugaya rapidly avoiding the tendrils in midair, which is awesome, before he brings his blade down upon Mayuri. In response, Mayuri quickly whips out his own Zanpakuto. Apparently he conceals literally everything in the sleeves of his sunsuit and crosses swords with Hitsugaya. The next sequence looks really really nice. Hitsugaya aggressively smashing his Zanpak toe repeatedly against Mayuri's from above, sparks flying everywhere as Mayuri reveals he installed a sensor in his Zanpak toe that enables it to automatically block all oncoming sword strikes. The anime makes it pretty clear that the sensor is some kind of biological creature with numerous questionable looking eyes poking out that watch for the oncoming sword strikes. But upon rereading it, you can tell in the original chapter as well, but it's just not quite as overt. It's interesting to think about this. If the sensor is some kind of living creature, and we know Mayuri likes to employ organic beings as his tools, as we see numerous times in both the past and the future, then how much control over where the Zanpakuto goes does this sensor actually have? Is it forcefully moving the weapon itself? Hitsugaya attempts to strike Mayuri with his knee, but Myri blocks him with a purple shield which envelops and then detonates, destroying Hitsugaya's joint, but the captain immediately covers it in ice and continues fighting. As Myri clashes with Hitsugaya again, the anime makes it a little clearer what actually happens next, which I really appreciate. As they lock swords once again, Hitsugaya grabs Myri's blade and holds it in place against Hyorin Maru so he can't escape before activating Bankai. As Daigurin Hyorin Maru manifests, ice spreads from Hitsugaya's blade and completely consumes Mayuri's Zanpak toe, forcing the captain to let go of it. It's an awesome little sequence and I absolutely love how this all looks in the episode. Mayuri takes a tentative step backwards but Hitsugaya is too fast for him and in a flash Hitsugaya splits Mayuri in two before seeding him up again with a vast spiked wave of ice. For the finishing blow, Hitsugaya drives his blade through Mayuri's chest, an icy flower blooming from Mayuri's back as the 12th Division's captain dies. This is a stunning shot, by the way. It always looked so cool in the source material, but the panel is tiny. Here, it really does look great, though. It's very artistic, and of course, in true Kubo fashion, it's extremely stylish. As blood pours from Mayuri's mouth, however, 
we suddenly find ourselves transported back to the beginning of their confrontation. Myri's drug translates very well to the anime. The near instantaneous flashback to that original scene is jarring in a good way, thrusting Hitsugaya back to the start of their altercation. I appreciate the anime doing its best to adapt to this scene, including the interesting angles on Myri's face. But Hitsugaya dives back into the fray, locking swords with Myri once more, this time demanding to know what's happening. It definitely seems like the effects of the drug are all just playing out in Hitsugaya's head, and he's hallucinating here. So presumably Myri is just watching with glee as the captain battles himself. The anime really didn't need to go so hard with the second time Hitsugaya activates Bankai. Ironically, it's probably the absolute smallest Bankai activation panel in the source material ever, but here it looks genuinely incredible, with Hitsugaya manifesting two majestic beating wings of ice as the dragon is formed around him. Hitsugaya instantly freezes Myri before the captain collapses to the ground and shatters into pieces. Of course, just as Hitsugaya thinks he's won, the scene flips back to the beginning once more. Fully realising he's been caught in a trap, Hitsugaya demands to know what's going on as Myri lets him in on the secret. Myri explains the power of this latest drug, sending Hitsugaya back into the past every time he crosses a particular threshold in the battle. Namely, whenever he kills Myri. The anime team definitely looks like they had a lot of fun with Myri during all of this. He has some truly demented expressions on his face as he details with glee exactly how the drug is affecting Hitsugaya before the icy captain crumples to the floor paralysed from the side effects. Thinking about it, Hitsugaya spends an awful lot of the second Quincy invasion lying collapsed on the ground, but Myri laments that his drug cannot yet be introduced to the market because of these side effects. I wonder what mass market appeal it would actually have though, perhaps as some kind of infinite training loop? But as we reach the end of chapter 593, yes, once again it was an extremely accurate adaptation with very little fat to it. As I speculated, they likely wanted to get through this section as quickly as possible without butchering the scene. And when it's mostly a combat sequence which traditionally flies by in the source material, the easiest way to do that is just to copy it shot for shot. This absolutely isn't a bad thing. For as short as Zombie Hitsugaya's time is in the anime, it did look pretty spectacular. Myri stabs the fallen Hitsugaya in the neck with his Shikai, Ashisogi Jizo paralysing his limbs further. I really like the effect of Ashisogi Jizo morphing as the blade transforms. But with Hitsugaya at his mercy, Myri injects him with a new drug, one that is, for now, unexplained. Hitsugaya roars almost immediately, his face contorting with pain and agony, a strange ethereal darkness spreading across his body, and of course Hitsugaya's voice actress does an incredible job with this horrible blood-curdling cry that, like I said in my reaction, reminded me of when Aizen tricked the captain into stabbing Hinamori. As if reacting to Hitsugaya's cries, several other zombies appear. Kensei, Rose and Rangiku all drop down behind Myori, preparing to intervene. What I believe is a new soundtrack plays during all of this madness, and it works fantastically. The track is erratic, capturing the unholy horror that's playing out as Myori realises many more Captain-level Shinigami have been turned into the Walking Dead. I was hoping that the anime might show us how Giselle actually came across Kensei and Rose's corpses since they were last seen in the care of Isan but unfortunately not. Also, if Giselle has this many captain-level fighters working for her, why only summon Hitsugaya initially? She may have actually won if she unleashed all four of them at once, though perhaps not since Myri did come prepared. However, since Hitsugaya was only infected by Myri's drug when he slashed Charlotte, what would Myri have done if Charlotte had never appeared and Hitsugaya had simply turned his attention to Myri immediately? In fact, that whole sequence is a little bit weird to think about since it seems like Myri doesn't anticipate Charlotte showing up and seems to actively condemn him for trying to attack Hitsugaya, despite that being exactly what Myri needs. However, Myri calls upon the Rankar once more, and the three of them jump into the fray, engaging with Kensei Rose and Rangiku while Myri watches the progress of his new drug 
Hamburg on a horrified Hitsugaya. And that's it for now, at least for the battle between Mairi and Giselle. It was extremely faithful to the source material, particularly this week, and for the most part I think it was handled really well. But I won't deny that I was mostly just waiting for what comes next, the final battle of the war for the Seireite, and everything else that comes with it. At this point in the source material, as we continue with chapter 594, Kubo controversially completely skipped over a battle between Byakia and three of the Sternritter. Sternritter N, Robert Accutrone, Sternritter U, Nana Nanajakoop, and Sternritter T, Candice Catnip. In the source material, we had no idea this fight was even taking place until now, and considering we'd not seen much from Nanana or Robert, their instant off-screen defeats were very disappointing to say the least. However, last week the anime actually featured a brand new scene setting up this fight, so many of us, myself included, were hopeful we'd get something new that actually showed us how this clash played out. To the anime's credit, so far it has been pretty good for new or extended fight scenes. Some examples include Ichigo vs. Yuha Bark in the first core, and Mask to Masculine vs. Ikaku Yumichika and Hisagi in the second. Of course, famously, Ichigo vs. the Bambis was dramatically extended, and now, yes, thankfully, the anime delivers once again with a wonderful fight scene for Byakia, Robert, Nanana, and Candice. It isn't particularly long, but the choreography is genuinely good, and it delivers on some fantastic character moments, particularly for Robert, who really gets one last opportunity to shine here. The information key cards this week were a bit of a giveaway, featuring Byakia's Bankai Senbon Zakura Kagiyoshi. Now, in the source material, I thought Byakuya had been using Bankai since the big skirmish between Shinigami and Quincy, where we can see him controlling Senbon Zakura with his hand. But we never saw him release it. In fact, in the source material, I don't think we ever actually see Byakuya activate Bankai ever again from this point onwards. He just seems to be using it all the time. So to see the Bankai's activation ritual on the keycard this week, well, it did give the game away a little bit. The initial shot of Byakia seems to be a recreation of the shot from chapter 594, depicting his victory over the Sternritter, except this time there's no unconscious bodies in the background. Byakia remains cautious when suddenly Robert charges towards him from the darkness, his basic Volston dish activated. While Robert's holy form has changed colour a few times over the course of the anime so far, I really do like this dark green one they've decided to settle on. But the fact that Robert is running is important, and we'll discuss that a bit later. Robert leaps over Byakia and fires several shots at him, but Byakia blocks the bullets with his blade, green sparks bursting into the air. Landing on the ground, Robert unloads another bullet towards Byakia, but the captain blocks it again, narrowly avoiding several other shots as well. As Robert then darts to the side, Candice jumps in, also using her Volston dish, and locks blades with Byakia. Dual wielding her crackling lightning bolts, Candice clashes with the captain, Emerald Ryatsu washing over them both as they dance back and forth. Candice's assault pushing Byakia back. Once she breaks off from him, Byakia is attacked from behind by Nanana, who tries to use his morphine pattern ability on him. Interestingly, Nanana isn't using his holy form for some reason, which is a little bit of a shame, as I'd have liked a name for it, but alas. Nanana's morphine pattern, taking the shape of a glittering orange U, slams into Byakia. However, despite this, Byakia doesn't have a single opening in his Reiatsu, likely thanks to the protective covering of his Oken robes. If Byakia hadn't been wearing his Oken robes, I wonder what would have happened here. Nanana's The Underbelly is later shown to be strong enough to affect Aizen, but it's hard to know if it's purely just because of the holes in Aizen's Reiatsu created by his prisoner garb. Even so, as Aizen himself states, rendering him unable to move for five minutes is a major achievement for Nanana, so maybe Byakia would have been defeated here. 
It's not too hard to see why Nanana never got a proper fight scene. His shrift is so weird and abstract that it likely would have been difficult to really muster one up. Also, how long has he been observing Byakia for at this point? It's stated that the longer Nanana observes an enemy for, the more powerful his ability is, but presumably he hasn't had much time to do so here. Anyway, starting to get worried, Nanana leaps backwards into the air and draws his Quincy bow, which consists of three rings, each containing three arrows, allowing him to fire nine arrows at once, which is pretty nice. Interestingly, I think we see Nanana's bow in the source material too, and it doesn't look like this. There it just appears to be made of several vertical spikes that we don't ever actually see him fire an arrow with it. This new version from the anime is not only better and more creative, but fits with the design of his holy form too. As Nanana fires his arrows at Byakia, the captain merely releases his Shikai, Senbon Zakura, and the petal blades completely overwhelm and envelop Nanana, forcing him backwards and slamming him into a nearby wall, knocking him out. Candice then attempts to launch a Galvano Javelin at Byakia. By the way, considering one Galvano Blast was enough to destroy Ichigo's Oken robes, I wonder if this would have obliterated Byakia's too. However, just as she tries to do so, her Volston dish suddenly disappears. Realising she's run out of energy, Candice can only watch as she's also consumed by Senbon Zakura, sending her crashing to the ground and skidding to a halt, her limp body half hanging off the side of some debris. Candice's holy form vanishing is really interesting to me as it never, I don't think, happens to anyone else. We know that using the Volston dish tires out certain Sternritter as we hear from Giselle, but I wonder if this instance is because Candice has only recently learned how to use it, though if I remember rightly that line was cut from the anime. It could even be tied to her shrift, the Thunderbolt. As an electrically charged power, maybe it does have some kind of a power supply aspect to it, and without constantly drawing in energy it will eventually fizzle out. Either way, Candice is also down for the count as well. Both Candice and Nanana being taken out by just a Shikai does seem pretty crazy, until you remember that Byakia's Shikai is now of similar density to his former Bankai, presumably, as we discover when Asnod couldn't tell the difference between the two. I've said it for a while now that post-Royal Realm Byakia goes a little underestimated, but here he's defeating, albeit not killing at least as far as we know, fairly competent Sternritter with basically a flick of his sword. However, with Candice and Nanana down, only Robert remains. While Robert is ultimately a fairly insignificant supporting villain, it's great to see him getting his dues here, as Kubo and the anime team clearly realise that presumably after his prominent role in in the first invasion, he deserved to get some more spotlight here. It was always really weird that he played such a major role in that first invasion, even shooting out Kyoraku's eye, only to be wasted so utterly in the second battle. So for the anime team to even give him a little bit of prominence here is great to see. Appearing behind Byakia, again demonstrating that ability to seemingly appear right where his enemy can't see him, Robert attempts to shoot Byakia, but the captain disappears. Ducking down, Byakia swings his sword at Robert, but the Sturmritter leaps over the blade. Spinning overhead, Robert lands in front of Byakia and declares that he will defeat both him and Ichigo Kurosaki before desperately screaming that then he'll be able to join Yuhabak's side in the royal palace. Once again, just like last week, I love that extra attention is being paid to the fact that Robert knows the terrible truth of the Sternritter's fates. He's getting this tiny little character arc almost where we see him initially being concerned, paying attention to the fact that Yuha Bark has gone up to the palace. Now he is actively sweating and really growing desperate, and presumably the next time we see him, well, we'll get to that either next week or more likely the week after. As one of the older Sternritter, and presumably one from a thousand years back, Robert knows that Sternritter deemed unnecessary will be sacrificed to Yuha Bark's Auschwellen. So he's trying to do everything he can to be granted that place at Yuhabark's side in order to escape a brutal death. It's pretty optimistic, I'll admit, thinking you'll defeat both Byakia and Ichigo in such a short amount of time, but there you go. Let's talk briefly about Robert and his potential history. 
How exactly does he know what Yu Harbach intends to do with unnecessary Sternritter? We know Yu Harbach hasn't told them his plans. Sternritter, like Little Toto and Giselle, are completely unaware they're on the chopping block and seem to think that they're just trying to win His Majesty's favour. And since Yu Harbach was soundly defeated a thousand years ago, I wonder when he had the chance to use Ausvalen even back then. I can imagine a scenario playing out like this. Yuha Bark takes his relatively newly formed Sternritter to the Soul Society, and perhaps they battle outside the gates of the Seirete to begin with. Eventually, however, Yuha Bark takes those he deems worthy with him into the Seirete itself, sacrificing the rest to power those up. A thousand years ago, perhaps Robert was one of the Sternritter who earned his place in the battle, and now he's watching history repeat itself, except unfortunately for him, he'll be on the wrong side of it this time. It is funny that Yuhabak chooses to take Askin up to the palace, despite him being the only Sternritter to have not really engaged anyone in a fight so far, but maybe that's the point. Yuhabak has always claimed to hate infighting. Creating discord like this amongst his knights weeds out those that don't respect him and don't play by the rules. Add to the fact that Askin is genuinely very powerful and you have a winner. I think it would be ironic and really cool if the hidden criteria for getting to survive and to go to the palace was to not fight anyone or even threaten to engage anyone on your own side during the war. Pointing his gun at Biakia once more, Robert activates Sklaveri just like the Bambis before him and bolsters the power of his Volsten dish. Absorbing the area around him, Robert's holy form transforms and evolves. Now he gains a new pair of boots that look as though they're perpetually in motion thanks to speed lines bleeding from the back of them, a pair of gloves and most prominently a face mask that covers everything but his eyes. Of course, Robert's form looks awesome, I love the colour of his Ryatsu, and while I'm not going to belay the point too much, no, we don't learn what his shrift is, despite this extension. I won't sugarcoat it, just like with BG9, it's totally ridiculous, and it feels like I'm being trolled, as someone in the comments of my reaction pointed out. But it also feels like there has to be a reason for it at this point. That being said, thanks to this new sequence, I feel like it is a little clearer what he's all about. He's the speedster of the Sternritter. While I still think my prediction of the Navigate is viable, where he identifies, teleports to, and exploits blind spots, it definitely seems like his shrift is focused on speed and movement. His Volstendish Grimaniel means the walk of God or God's step, and as pointed out before, he has a habit of appearing right behind or beside people in a flash. I also used to think that the wings of his holy form were meant to be some kind of static, but actually they're clearly also speed lines as well. So it's absolutely possible then that his shrift is something like the nimble or the nearby, any of those are viable choices. I'm surprised that when the Sternritter use Sklaveri in these situations, they don't try and absorb their Shinigami opponent. I'm not saying they'd be successful, but they might at least injure them a little. And can I just say as well, that after seeing this, I really wish Byakia's actual fight in this arc was against Robert. I know Kubo wasn't focusing on mirror matches in this arc, but the two do go together very well. They're both the upstanding, gentlemanly type figures of their factions, and of course they're both extraordinarily fast. Plus, giving Pepe to someone else would make this fight feel a lot less like Zomari 2.0. Add to that that if Robert's shrift really is focused on super speed, he has a totally unique shrift amongst the Sternritter, and I really wish this had actually happened in the source material. Anyway, deciding that this enhanced version of Robert is enough of a threat, Byakia activates his Bankai as Robert blasts towards him. That one shot we get of Robert flitting towards Byakia is awesome, creating a similar vacuum of air behind him that Ichigo did when he arrived on the battlefield a few episodes back. As Byakia's Bankai explodes in a torrent of pink petals, Robert approaches for the final clash and lifts his gun, firing a single bright green bullet at the captain. However, as soon as the bullet reaches the edge of the petal storm, it's neatly sliced in two, and Robert is totally devoured by Senbon Zakura Kagiyoshi. As the dust clears, Byakia stands surrounded by the defeated Sternritter. It's mostly the same as the source material, except I think Robert looks considerably worse for wear. Honestly, 
He looks dead to me, though I suspect he probably isn't. I mentioned in my live reaction that they actually used that same shot of Robert screaming hysterically that can be found during his actual death scene, which will potentially happen a couple of weeks from now, maybe episode 25, unless it's totally cut. But I highly doubt it's been cut or else the context for Robert progressively freaking out will be totally meaningless. Perhaps just that one shot of him will be gone instead, or maybe that scene is just being changed up for the anime. But that's it for the brand new fight scene, and I honestly loved it. Did we need it? Technically no, because we find ourselves in the same place as the source material by the end of it, but this is one of the things the anime does best. Really fleshing out those missing moments, and people wanted to see how this went down. In my opinion, this sequence is nothing but a net positive for every character involved. Robert, as the last remaining prominent Sternritter from the first invasion, gets a decent showcase of his power, and even forces Byakia to use Bankai. Admittedly, it wipes him out instantly, as it reasonably should. While Byakia actually gets a good fight before the Pepe debacle begins. And speaking of which... Watching the fight from the side, Lil Toto and Meninas comment on the battle. I will say their dialogue doesn't seem to make as much sense anymore. Initially, it looked as though they'd been fighting Byakia alongside the other three, which was why Meninas mentioned that it made sense that, with their powers, they were the last two standing. Except here, they clearly haven't been involved at all. As Lil Toto wonders where Pepe is, Hisagi arrives on the scene, letting Byakia know he's defeated a Sternritter, but of course, as we've discussed in the past, he almost certainly hasn't, and instead is already under Pepe's control at this point. As Hisagi looks around, we see the defeated three and the extent of their wounds. Robert appears to have been shredded by Senbonzakura Kagiyoshi pretty badly. If he actually does get up from that, as I'm expecting him to, then that's another testament to the inherent power and durability of the Sternritter. The rest of chapter 594 is adapted pretty faithfully. Hisagi attempts to attack Byakia, protesting that he's not being controlled and is instead only doing what Pepe wants of him. At that moment, Pepe himself arrives, floating towards the battle on his little platform, chuckling to himself. Hilariously, the anime is playing Shinji's brand new theme, further associating the Vizards with failure. The theme that was used for Shinji's big moment in his battle with Bambietta is now also going to be prominently associated with the squat little love Guru Sternritter that everyone loves to hate, and it feels kind of weirdly fitting. I'm only kidding, Shinji fans, but your captain really does struggle to get a win, and even when he does, it's later repurposed for characters like Pepe. As Pepe receives his splash screen, interestingly not featuring his face, he betrays Lil Toto and Meninas, attempting to strike them with Love Kiss. A few commenters pointed this out in my reaction, but the colour and later appearance of Pepe's love abilities feels quite fitting. I initially expected it to be a very bright hot pink, akin to Meninas, but this is actually better. It's like the colours traditionally affiliated with themes of love, but infected and gross, giving it a sort of putrid look, and it also means it's totally unique. Meninas is struck by the love kiss and immediately falls in love with Pepe, instantly attacking Lil Toto, as Pepe mockingly says that he never considered that all of the glory would be his if everyone else was killed, ending chapter 594. Moving into chapter 595, the battle between Byakia and Hisagi plays out mostly the same as the original chapter, with the two of them locking swords as Pepe looks on, waxing lyrical about love itself. A fair chunk of Pepe's speech has been cut. Unfortunately, my favourite part where he remarks that even faith and belief are love, and it's safe to say his villainous monologue doesn't receive the same love, no pun intended, that Asnods did a few episodes ago. Luckily, my favourite sequence of the actual battle itself is left intact and looks pretty good too, with Byakia fleeing from Pepe's laser beam attack as the sickly pink Ryatsu coats the buildings behind the captain. As Pepe tries to cut Byakia off with another blast, the captain simply turns and slashes it, the attack dissipating. Personally, I think the moment where Sinbon Zakara tries to strike Byakia happens a bit too fast to have any any real impact, but it's cool seeing Byakia act so quickly and try to push the blade aside, slicing open his hand at the same time. As Byakia tosses the traitorous Senbon Zakura away, Hisagi takes the sword for himself and moves to attack Byakia. 
This next action sequence looks almost unreasonably good as Hisagi, now wielding both Kazushini and Senbon Zakura, forces Byakia back, and is a vast improvement over the source material. Byakia's line about using Kido against Hisagi is gone completely, which feels for the best in my opinion. Perhaps the team decided it was better that Byakia seemingly didn't get a chance to even think about Kido, rather than raise questions about why he simply didn't use a Bakudo. As Byakia lands on the ground, Pepe appears behind him, firing a love kiss at his back. But here in the anime, it simply shatters when it comes into contact with his robe. Again, much like Nanana's morphine pattern not working earlier, this is due to the Oken robes Byakia is wearing. Though I wonder why the robes didn't just cause Nanana's Yu to shatter as well. Annoyed that Byakia can't seem to feel love, Pepe activates his Volston dish Gudo Aero and impales the captain with love rope, seemingly rooting him to the spot. As Pepe transforms, he doesn't receive the column of light like the rest of the Sternritter, but the trademark church bells do ring in the background. As weird as it is, something about Pepe's holy form isn't quite as repulsive as it is in the original chapter. I think it might be due to how little we actually see it, as the anime really emphasizes just how quickly Pepe is brought down after utilising it. That being said, Love Rope looks pretty cool, and again, I like how the usual sparkly, angelic glittering of the holy forms seems to be a little bit muted beneath the fetid colouring of Pepe's Reatsu. As Hisagi races to finish off Byakia, Pepe orders him to stop, instead deciding to kill Byakia himself. Pepe draws his bow and arrow from his mouth, regurgitating his spirit weapon as Byakia looks on in disgust before preparing to fire. I really like the little details here. The tiny hearts spilling out of the arrowhead make me think that Pepe's arrows do indeed contain the power of his shrift after all. However, before he can fire, Pepe is kicked in the face and sent flying into a building. I mentioned in my battle analysis that it's right here that Pepe is turned into a complete joke of a villain, and that's true for the source material. But the truth is, by removing a lot of Pepe's prior context, and thanks to his overall depiction in the anime, he kind of felt like a joke villain from the start here, which makes me expect a lot less out of him, and maybe that's for the best. As we reach the end of chapter 595, Byakia looks on in shock as the zombified Kensei and Rose arrive on the battleground. Hisagi leaps at them, still wielding Senbon Zakura, but Kensei puts him down quickly, knocking out his vice captain before returning Byakia's weapon to him. Much like in the source material, I don't know why Senbon Zakura is suddenly being compliant, but there you go. As Myri appears, he reveals the truth behind what happened to Kensei and Rose, and how his battle with Giselle actually came to an end. While I mentioned in my battle analysis that I don't really like how these two fights intersect like this, effectively neutering the endings of both fights, it actually feels less egregious here in the anime, and I think that's simply because we see the tail end of Mayuri's fight here in the same episode, making the connection between the two feel a little more organic. Interestingly, there's no indication given that Mayuri's explanation is taking place in the past here, whereas in the source material it's depicted as a flashback. Mayuri explains that the zombie captains were afflicted with his new drug after he mixed it into his Rankar warrior's blood, which of course then splashed onto the zombies during their fight. This is of course a pretty straightforward reference to Giselle herself, whose shrift activates when her blood splashes onto her victims. And so in many ways in this fight, Myri kind of becomes the counter Giselle. Myri then details how Giselle's shrift actually works, and how his new drug is able to reverse the effects, transforming her zombies into his zombies turning them against her. I do love Giselle's facial expressions and her dumbfounded, glazed overlook as Mayuri goes on about how he's about to win the fight, essentially. But as Kensei and Rose rise up behind the 12th Division's captain, Kensei impales Giselle with his blade and ends the battle. Once again, I need to emphasize that this is basically all following the source material right down to the letter. 
there are very few changes, very few cuts, very few additions. There's just not much to say about most of these segments as they are very similar. Byakia is of course disgusted, accusing Myri of toying with the lives of his fellow captains, but Myri attempts to justify himself. At this moment, Pepe suddenly re-emerges, successfully hitting Kensei with Love Kiss. As Pepe tries to explain that his love is stronger than Giselle's, the zombie Kensei punches him in the face, sending him flying backwards. And here's a very interesting change that comes out of nowhere. Kensei is using his Bankai Tekken Tachikaze now. In the source material, Kensei simply beats up Pepe with his bare fists, but here, as Myri informs Pepe that his zombies can't feel love and Pepe's mouth opens wide in terror, Side note, I don't think the brief sound Pepe makes here really fits with the image. I feel like it should be a really sharp intake of breath. Kensei unleashes a colossal smackdown onto the vile Sternritter, repeatedly smacking him in the face and body with his Bankai. As Pepe's face warps and twists every time Kensei's fists come into contact with him, it's a really lovely piece of animation. As I mentioned in my reaction, someone at the anime team clearly wanted to see Pepe get what was coming to him. The motion is extremely fluid, the music builds nicely, and overall it's a great climax to the fight here. Here. The fact that Kensei is using Bankai is interesting though, and in my opinion, a good change. Pepe is a creep, yes, but he's still a stern ritter and a decently strong one at that. It's been a common through line of the entire arc that the average stern ritter can't be defeated without Bankai, so it just makes sense for Kensei to use it against him to really try and put him down for good. But it also makes Pepe look a lot better too. In my battle analysis, I mentioned that I thought it was impressive that Pepe is basically unhurt after getting pummeled by Kensei. Well, crank that up a notch, because now he's basically unhurt after being wailed on by Kensei and Bankai instead. Presumably, Kensei's Bankai is working like it did against Mask, where every punch impacts the enemy over and over again. It's just that Kensei's fists are moving so fast, they never stay in one place long enough to really get the full effect. But yeah, as Pepe is sent flying yet again, this time crashing into a nearby building block, I have to commend him. He is pretty much, save for a few streaks of blood in his beard and a couple of bruises, unhurt it seems, which is pretty crazy and another example of the Sternritter being unusually tanky. But with Pepe launched into the nearby building, we find ourselves at the end of 596 and the start of 597. I presume it's just being done for comedic purposes and is meant to make Pepe look even more pathetic than he already does. But did his pants really need to split and allow us to see his butt? That's an anime-only change I could have absolutely done without. I'll be honest though, I think the anime completely nails this final scene. I wasn't expecting it to be anywhere near as good as it is, but it really works. Coughing up blood, Pepe curses all of those who have embarrassed him. But as soon as the shadowy little Toto steps into the frame, the music changes. It takes on a really sinister, grisly tone, as Pepe realises the danger that he's now in. He tries to sweet talk Lil Toto, but she activates her holy form and advances on him as the holy bells ring, signalling the end has come for Pepe. In my opinion, despite how dark the subject matter of this scene actually is, it always felt like it was mostly just being played for laughs in the original chapter. Here, though, it's a full-on horror show. Pepe attempts to crawl away but collapses, Lil Toto approaching him, her face hidden behind a veil of darkness almost the entire time. When Lil Toto speaks, demanding Pepe take responsibility for trying to kill her and Meninas, she sounds genuinely angry, like a rage is bubbling beneath her surface. Whereas again, in the source material, I always got the impression that although she was clearly out for revenge, she seemed her normal, aloof self. Pepe's voice actor does a great job too, really conveying how pathetic and childish he is in his final moments as Lil Toto activates the glutton and her mouth opens wide to devour him whole. However, it is a very abrupt ending to the episode, likely due to the fact there's a post credit scene, but I wonder if next week might show something of a follow-up, as in the source material there's a huge blood splatter followed by the sounds of Pepe being consumed from behind some debris. 
but it's probably unlikely though. But that's not the end of the episode just yet. We get a post credit scene for the first time in a couple of episodes at least, I think. As expected, it's the cut cliffhanger of chapter 587, followed up by several pages of chapter 588, featuring of course Yuha Bark's long-awaited arrival in the royal palace. I really like the dynamic angle when Yuha Bark's boot comes crashing down onto the walkway, it looks awesome, and I'm just so excited for this portion of the story in general. It's great to finally be here. It's really nice to get out from underneath that red sky for a little bit too. The colours here are just much better in general. As Yuhabak and the others explode onto the scene, the reactions of the Zero Division members are all cut. I wonder if perhaps they'll be added in next week. And the episode ends very ominously, and on a great cliffhanger as Yuhabak steps forward, Ryokyu in his sights. Of course, the poem for this week comes courtesy of Oetsu, and is the same poem as was featured in volume 66, simply reading, Is Life All That You Can Cut? While next week's episode, episode 24, is titled Too Early to Win, Too Late to Know, after chapter 599, and is one of, if not my absolute favourite chapter title in the entire series, so I'm really pleased to see it featured as an episode title. Right, well that's it for episode 23, and before we move on to our predictions, it's time once again for Sternritter in Memoriam. This week was a bumper week for Sternritter losses. A record number of Sternritter were defeated in battle in episode 23. Giselle, Robert, Nanana, Candice, Pepe, and even to some degree, Meninus and Lil Toto. However, despite that, we'll only be adding one Sternritter to the Wall of Memorial this week. Sternritter L the Love, Pepe Wakabrada. I mean, of all the losses this week, he's the one that's definitely dead. There's a chance he shows up next week if the anime recaps his death, but it feels unlikely. Still, the wall is getting pretty full as we close in on the end of the second part of the Thousand Year Blood War anime. I toyed with adding Candice and Meninas to the wall this week, as even though they're not dead, this could potentially be the very last time we see them, as this marks their final appearances in the source material, though I have a feeling the anime might rectify that. As for our predictions, well I'm not going to go too deep into predictions this week as I covered mostly everything I wanted to in last week's review, but here's a shorthand version. I was correct almost exactly in how I thought this episode would be covered. It seems by stuffing episodes 20 and 21 full of content, the anime team was able to buy themselves time here at the end of the core, a worthwhile trade-off, in my opinion. If episode 24 covers a similar number of chapters, then I don't think we'll quite reach the full battle between the Zero Division and the Schutzstoffel just yet. Back when I was speculating on where this core might end, one of the answers I threw into the ring was the cliffhanger of chapter 600, where Oetsu challenges the Schutzstoffel to combat. Honestly, this cliffhanger still works really well for me, so I could see the episode ending there. But that's not a lot of chapters. 597, 598, 599, 600. It would be the smallest amount of chapter coverage in a while, but I just don't see the episode stretching to 601 and ending on Askin's survival, though I do believe that chapter is the last chapter of volume 66. But it would mean that the episode would face a similar issue to this week, if not even worse. Askin would be the cliffhanger, only to die in like the first minute or two of episode 25, and I just don't see that happening. Now, the episode could push all the way to 602's ending, featuring New Hobart gearing up for the Al Shvalen, but it's hard to say. 600 feels the most likely to me, as it's a really great cliffhanger, and it absolutely teases the showdown to come. Also, if the next episode does end on 604, that means if episode 25 covers, say, 601 to 604, which is the Zero Division versus Schutzstoffel battle, that's again a tiny number of chapters. Plenty of time for that extended fight between those two sides that we're all hoping for. As for episode 24, I could see the scenes featuring Ichigo and the others from 597 and 598 brought forward to the front of the episode to again allow for the battle in the Royal Palace to be uninterrupted. Before anything really happens there, Tenjiro is the first member of the Royal Guard to confront the Quincy's, and he even activated his Shikai in the source material. It's just, of course, we didn't see what it could do at all, so I'd love for that to be expanded on to actually explain what Kinpika does. Then I'm expecting Nyanzol to be dealt with very quickly. 
I don't think there will be anything added to his battle, though of course I could be wrong, but Nyanzal was killed so fast to help emphasise just how powerful and deadly the Zero Division actually are. Obviously, I'd take a Shikai reveal from Senju Maru, but that's the sort of thing I'm really, truly hoping we get from an extended fight with the Schutzstoffel later on. Of course, though, I'm really looking forward to seeing the Schutzstoffel in action at last. And my boy Askin is finally going to be a prominent villain in the arc, which I can't wait for. I think, I hope, We've got a trilogy of really fantastic episodes ahead of us. So, as with episode 22 before it, episode 23 of the Thousand Year Blood War arc, Marching Out the Zombies 2, was a pleasant surprise. Even if the Pepe fight isn't very good, there's something more inherently interesting about the insanity taking place in the Seireite at this point in time over the straightforward battle between Myri and Giselle. So I was personally always looking forward to this episode, and I think it delivered on almost all fronts. And actually, thanks to some unnecessarily good animation, great voice acting, and rapid-fire pacing, I think the Biakia vs. Pepe fight is possibly better here in the anime than in the source material. When you also take into account the finale of Mayuri vs Giselle and seeing zombie Hitsugaya's cold-blooded ruthlessness in motion, it was a really solid episode, bolstered of course by the amazing new fight which was the ultimate highlight of the episode this week. For me, at least. Yes, it's a shame we still didn't get Robert's shrift, and I think not giving us the final two shrifts we're missing is one of the biggest, strangest, most glaring omissions in the anime so far, to the point where I think there must be a reason for it, but the sequence itself was still fantastic. A real visual delight too. And like I said earlier, just a total net positive for the episode and the characters involved. And so as we close this week, let's pay our final respects to our Lord and Saviour Pepe. You were just too pure for this world. But that's it for the video this week, guys. I really hope you enjoyed it. Of course, let me know your thoughts and feelings down below. Did you enjoy episode 23 of the Thousand Year Blood War arc? What did you think of the conclusion to Myri vs. Giselle? What did you think of how Biakia vs. Pepe was adapted? And of course, let me know your thoughts about the new fight, Biakia vs. Robert, Candice, and Nanana. I'd love to hear your thoughts down below. What do you think Robert Shrift is, and what are you most looking forward to in next week's episode when you Yuhabark finally takes on the Zero Division. Make sure to hit subscribe if you enjoyed the video, guys. Give it a thumbs up as well. I really would appreciate all of the support. And of course, a massive thank you as always to each and every one of you who keeps coming out, keeps watching these videos every week. It really does mean the world to me, and I can't express that enough. So thank you all again so very much. And until next time, I'll catch you later, and I'll see you then.